Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad that you're joining us tonight. We are returning to our study of the book of Exodus, and tonight we are ready for Exodus chapter 34. So we want to invite you to be turning with us to Exodus chapter 34. We'll be there in just a moment. As always, if you have any questions or comments concerning tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we are back to Exodus. And by way of very brief review, God's people are now free from their slavery in Egypt. They have crossed over the Red Sea. They have received God's law on Mount Sinai. But of course, while Moses was up there on the mountain, they made and they worshipped a golden calf. And when Moses came down from the mountain, he smashed those tablets. And so uh, they had to pay for that over the past couple weeks they were punished and so this week we pick up with what happens next and this brings us to Exodus chapter 34 and the first paragraph tonight is Exodus 34 verses 1 through 9 Exodus chapter 34 verses 1 through 9 now the Lord said to Moses cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered so be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No man is to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of that mountain. So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took two stone tablets in his hand. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. He said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go along in our midst, even though the people are so obstinate, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your own possession. Well, starting in verse 1, God prepares Moses to download a second copy of the law from the cloud to the tablets, and has him start by replacing the tablets themselves. So this right here is on Moses. He broke the first two tablets, and so it's up to him to replace these. You know, God will not do for us what we can do for ourselves. I think that's kind of a general principle in Scripture. And so this is something Moses can do. Cutting tablets out of stone is apparently something within uh, the realm of possibility here for Moses. And so he's to then bring these tablets to the Lord up on there on the mountain the following morning, which he does. And one thing I appreciate about this is that Moses rises up early in the morning to get this done. Uh, some of you know I am definitely a morning person, and I like getting stuff done early in the morning. So I just appreciate that reference here. There are several other uh, similar references spread throughout Scripture, not too many. But this is one of those where somebody in the Bible gets up early in the morning to accomplish something. Well, as Moses obeys, God meets with him there on the mountain, passing by, making this statement that was referenced in our Bible class this last Lord's Day morning. Uh, this is a summary of who God is. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And this is where we have this statement from God where he explains that when we sin, those sins that we commit have a way of affecting future generations. Of course, we know from other passages that our descendants do not carry the guilt of our sins. We know this from the book of Ezekiel. I think it's chapter 18. Uh, however, we also know that our descendants may, in fact, suffer from the consequences of sins that we've committed. And I know, I don't know about you, but to me that thought is both terrifying, but it is also very motivating. And what I mean by that is what we do right now may affect our great-great-grandchildren and even beyond. And that could be good or bad, depending on our behavior. Hopefully our good influence lasts several generations, 
But of course, it's possible that our misbehavior could also affect several generations if they turn away from the Lord because of something that we have or have not done. Well, in response, Moses bows low to the ground and he worships. He begs the Lord to continue with his people, even though they were a stubborn and rebellious people. And he is confessing the sins of the people before the Lord. And I kind of find it interesting here that Moses confesses this. So he says this to God himself, even though Moses was not personally responsible for the golden calf incident. Moses wasn't even there. Of course, he was the leader of the people. He delegated the leadership to Aaron for the 40-day period. But Moses confesses this sin before the Lord. And so once again, uh, Moses is interceding on behalf of the people. And I think that's a reminder for us that as God's people, uh, we sometimes have the power to intercede. We may be praying for somebody who doesn't have a relationship with God. Uh, not that God will somehow miraculously start a relationship with this person, but if that person's sick, if they're having family trouble, if they're going through some uh, difficult time, we can go to God in prayer on their behalf. And that's exactly what Moses does here. So let's continue with Exodus 34, verses 10 through 17, the next paragraph. Exodus 34, verses 10 through 17. Then God said, Behold, I am going to make a covenant. Before all your people I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all the earth nor among any of the nations. And all the people among whom you live will see the working of the Lord. For it is a fearful thing that I am going to perform with you. Be sure to observe what I am commanding you this day. Behold, I am going to drive out the Amorite before you, and the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going, or it will become a snare in your midst. But rather you are to tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and cut down their asherim. For you shall not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Otherwise you might make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they would play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods. And someone might invite you to eat of his sacrifice, and you might take some of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters might play the harlot with their gods, and cause your sons also to play the harlot with their gods. You shall make for yourself no molten gods. In the first few verses here, God reminds his people that they are special. Uh, he will do things for them that uh, he has not done for any other nation. And so I think what he's saying here, if I could summarize, is prepare to be amazed. We're just getting started. And so we have a little bit of a preview of what's coming over the next several years. And then notice God gives a command. When you get to the promised land, you are to drive out the inhabitants of that land. And there are no exceptions. And as with any command, God gives the power to accomplish that command. And this is no exception to that rule either. So they can do this. That's the, uh, I think the message here, God is telling them to do it. And he's not telling them to do some impossible thing, but he's telling them that he'll help them along the way. So, however, we would also note that they have to step out in faith and obey this command. God is not going to just do this for them. God will drive them out, but the people will play a role in getting it done. And notice God warns them here, do not make any covenants or any agreements or any treaties with these people because to do so would be a snare or a trap. And of course, we discussed uh, the danger of snares and traps in our study of Proverbs this past Lord's Day morning. But the message is, tear down the altars, do not under any circumstances worship their gods, do not intermarry with these people. And so here we see God giving a very clear warning. And of course, based on what comes later, we realize that God can see what's coming. And I almost think about this uh, like being a parent. There are times when it's almost like parents can predict the future. Isn't that a strange thing? We kind of know what our children might be prone to do. And so we can often see something coming. And it's not that we can literally see the future, but we know them well enough to know what they may or may not do. And I almost think about that in that sense. We can see things that little kids can't see, not that we are inspired miraculously. Uh, but in that case, again, it's not some kind of supernatural foreknowledge, but parents have a lifetime of experience. They've been where the three-year-old has been. Well, God's people, of course, will suffer tremendously in the future, won't they, for not obeying this command that's given right here. 
And so they do make covenants with the locals. They do intermarry with the locals. They do worship their gods over the next several hundred years. But God warns them right here. Uh, but the people will disobey, and that'll cause themselves and their descendants a whole lot of suffering as a result of this. And so it's interesting that that's tied to this thing uh, with the, with the uh, descendants suffering as the result of the sins of their forefathers. So again, they're not suffering the guilt, uh, but they are, in fact, will, they will suffer the consequences of, uh, of the earlier behavior. And a big part of the issue here is that God is jealous, isn't he? And it's even his name. One of the names of God is jealous. He is a jealous God. And I know normally uh, we think of jealousy as being a bad thing, uh, but there are times when jealousy is admirable. There are times when jealousy is not bad at all. In fact, it's even required under some circumstances. You know, if a wife is stepping out on her husband, the husband has every right to be jealous. That's kind of a part of being married. And that's what's going on here. God is their God, but these people are gonna end up worshiping other gods, just as they did with the golden calf. And God can see it coming, and I'm sure it breaks his heart, and yet he gives the warning here for that reason. Well, let's continue with Exodus 34, verses 18 through 24, the next little paragraph. Exodus 34, verses 18 through 24. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you, at the appointed time in the month of Abib, for in the month of Abib you came out of Egypt. The first offspring from every womb belongs to me, and all your male livestock, the first offspring from cattle and sheep. You shall redeem with a lamb the first offspring from a donkey, and if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. You shall redeem all the firstborn of your sons. None shall appear before me empty-handed. You shall work six days, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during plowing time and harvest you shall rest. You shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks, that is, the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year all your males are to appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your borders, and no man shall covet your land when you go up three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. The way I see this, God is basically just giving a very quick summary of the law. So as he gives Moses a second copy of these tablets, these are some of the highlights. So I know you didn't get it the first time, uh, but here I'm repeating some of the big things. So they need to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's one of the big ones. Notice in verses 19 and 20, the firstborn belong to God. All of them, from people to animals. This is intended to remind people that everything belongs to God. Uh, they are to give the firstborn as a reminder that everything else is the Lord's also. And we've got the reminder here that things can be redeemed, things can be bought back. And I appreciate the reminder at the end of verse 20, none shall appear before me empty-handed. In other words, when they come before the Lord in worship, they are to bring something. Even the poorest of the poor need to bring something to the Lord. And I think that's a concept that certainly seems to be repeated under the New Covenant. All of us, regardless of how much money we do or don't have, we have something to contribute, whether much or little. In verses 21 through 24, this summary of the law continues. Keep the Sabbath, uh, you know, rest on the seventh day. And I appreciate here how he points out, even when it's hard to do that, even during planting and harvest, even when things are difficult, you've got to slow down and you need to take a break one out of every seven days. So keep the Sabbath, celebrate the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Ingathering or the Harvest. All males have to appear before the Lord three times a year. And in response, God is gonna do his part by removing the locals from the land and then protecting the land while the men are traveling to appear before him. And that's an interesting concept right there. So of course, one of the excuses, if I've gotta travel from my farm to go to some far off place to worship God, one of the excuses that I might give is, I can't leave my family undefended. And not only that, all of these surrounding nations, they're gonna start to get the hint that these people all leave their homes three times a year, so this is gonna be a good time to attack. But I just wanna emphasize that we don't see that happening, even though that would be a natural thing to happen. God supernaturally protected the people as they traveled to far off places to worship. Eventually that would be Jerusalem. They were not attacked uh, during those feasts because God was protecting them in a special way. Well, let's pick up with Exodus 34 verses 25 through 28. Exodus 34, 25 through 28. 
You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor is the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover to be left over until morning. You shall bring the very first of the first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did not eat bread or drink water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Well, this summary of the law continues with some of the highlights, the reminder not to mix the blood of the sacrifice with the leavened bread. Uh, they were not to leave any leftovers from the Passover. They are to bring God the first fruits of their crops. They're not to boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And I know, as we discussed a few weeks ago, this is where our Jewish friends get the idea that they are not to eat cheeseburgers. You're not to mix that kind of thing. That's just disgusting. It's just wrong uh, under the law. So, uh, again, we don't have everything here. These are kind of the, the big ones, the things that maybe they would have a hard time with. And so these are some of the highlights in the law that God wants repeated. So Moses is to write all this down because this is the covenant that God has made with his people. Moses is up there on the mountain for 40 days, 40 nights. And yet again, we, we learned that he fasted during that time. And I know, as we've discussed previously, fasting was never commanded in the law of Moses. If you think that that's wrong, I want you to let me know if you can find a place where fasting was commanded under the law. In my mind, uh, for many years, I always assumed that God said, thou shalt not eat on some day. Um, and yet, as far as I can tell, in the actual law of Moses, that is not to be found. Uh, they were to humble themselves on the Day of Atonement. That's in there. And later, uh, scholars interpreted that to mean fasting. And yet the actual command is not there. Later on in the prophets, fasting was regulated because this is something they were doing, and they were doing it incorrectly. They were dishonoring God. And so they had to correct those abuses of it. But at least as far as I can tell, fasting was never commanded in the law. Uh, Moses, though, fasted here. And apparently it was this voluntary act of humility and submission before the Lord. And it's easy to miss this. You know, sometimes we forget that Moses fasted for 40 days. Other Bible characters fasted. Esther fasted. Uh, Daniel, I believe, the prophet, I think he fasted. Jesus, of course, fasted for 40 days as well. Uh, but it was never commanded in the law of Moses itself. Uh, at the end of this passage, we've got the first reference in Scripture to the Ten Commandments. And that's kind of surprising to me. So we had the actual commandments back in Exodus chapter 20, but they were never referred to as being the Ten Commandments until we get to this passage right here. And that's kind of neat. I, I, sometimes we forget that. It's in the heading of our Bible, the man-made heading in uh, Exodus chapter 20. Most of you will have something like that. Uh, but in the actual Word of God, they are not called the Ten Commandments until we get to this right here. All right, let's conclude tonight with the last paragraph, Exodus 34, 29 through 35. Exodus 34, 29 through 35. It came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation returned to him. And Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the sons of Israel came near, and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. We now have Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments a second time. And thankfully, there's no golden calf this time. Little baby steps, they're doing a little bit better here. Uh, but this time we learn that Moses' face was shining as a result of meeting with God up there on the mountain. And it's kind of an interesting note here. Aaron, the people, they see this. They're absolutely terrified. 
and uh, this is scary. You know, I can't look anymore. So Moses calls the leaders of the people together. He speaks to them, uh, probably passing along what God had communicated up there. And then Moses speaks to the whole group, only now he covers his face with a veil uh, so as not to terrify the people any further. Uh, before we wrap it up tonight, I want to just note uh, two more things. First of all, the word describing Moses' face as being radiant is very similar to the word for horns. Going back to an old English translation, or an old Latin translation, rather. And so there's been some interesting confusion through the years, especially with some of the manuscripts that we had several uh, years ago. Before we got it cleared up with some older manuscripts that weren't discovered until more recent times, uh, some people took this word for uh, a radiance, and it was very similar to the word for horns, and so they assumed that Moses had horns. <laughs> and it's kind of funny. I mean, I see some of this old artwork, and I laugh out loud. Maybe you've seen some of this, and I hope you'll keep an eye out for it in the artwork from four or five hundred years ago. Um, if Moses has horns in, in the artwork that you see, you're like, what in the world? I don't remember that in the Bible, but uh, this is it. it. It comes back to this passage right here. Um, these are not second-rate artists either. These are not people just making stuff up and doing a bad job. Um, we got a piece by Michelangelo on the left and a woodcut uh, by Gustave Doré on the right. Um, so these are well-known artists, and today we understand Moses' face was radiant. But a few hundred years ago, they thought that Moses came down from the mountain with freshly sprouted horns popping out of his head. And so if you see some old artwork depicting Moses with horns, I just want you to know that it all goes back to a misunderstanding of this word for radiant and a little mix-up that happened in the Latin translation of the old Hebrew text. So I think I'm reminded then to be thankful for the scholars and for the translators who have dedicated their lives to the science of textual criticism as it's known. Uh, this is the practice of trying to get back to the oldest and the most reliable manuscripts. Um, just because we had a certain manuscript back in the early 1600s does not necessarily mean that that is the oldest manuscript. It's the one that we had at the time, but over the past 400 plus years we have discovered older manuscripts. The deeper we dig over in that part of the world, the more we discover. The older manuscripts we find, which are of course most likely to be closer to the original. So we're dealing with a copy of a copy instead of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And it's that second category that they had access to back in the 1600s, and uh, now we've gone even further back than that. So I'm totally oversimplifying it, and I've got some good books I could recommend if you want to look at that more. But you know, sometimes some people may think that an older translation, like the King James Version Forever, is more accurate because it is older and it's got the archaic language and so the the natural tendency is to think "Ooh, that's an old one we want the old bible um, but that is not necessarily the case i might compare it to medicine if you need a surgery of some kind you could certainly uh, you would not want your doctor to restrict him or herself to only using methods and tools from 400 years ago would you no, you know, we're, then we're dealing with leeches and drilling a hole in the head to let the evil spirits out and all kinds of weird stuff. So I'm just saying our goal is accuracy, especially with regard to scripture. And sometimes that actually means bypassing what we had available to us in 1611 and going back even further into the past, which is actually closer to the originals. And again, these differences that I'm talking about here are incredibly minor. Uh, but it results in something like this, where Moses is not radiant, but he has... A horn sprouting out of his head. So is that a salvation issue? Is that going to keep you out of heaven if you think that Moses had horns? I don't think so. But I'm saying these uh, differences are rather minor. Uh, but we do want to be as accurate as we possibly can be. And so it's very important that we keep looking, that we keep translating, that we keep going back to the originals, that we keep looking for the oldest possible manuscripts. The other thing I wanted to note tonight before we close is that Paul actually refers to what happens here in Exodus 34 over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. And I would encourage you to read the whole chapter. It kind of starts earlier, but we're cutting it off uh, kind of for, for time's sake. But in 2 Corinthians, if I could just summarize, uh, Paul is basically defending his apostleship. And so he was there in Corinth. He's left. He's written a couple letters back. And there are some people there who are saying, well, who does Paul think he is? Why should we listen to him? And, and so... 
um, Paul has to write them and he has to defend himself. You know, you really should listen to me because Jesus appointed me as an apostle. I'm the real deal and so on. And they were saying that Paul really didn't have the authority to lead people away from the old and towards something new. And so he defends that authority. And so in the process of defending the new, this is the argument that he makes. This is 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 18. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed what had glory, in this case, has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. And I know there's a whole lot in this paragraph, but so Paul is just basically making a contrast between the old and the new. So if you thought the old was glorious, and it was, the new is even more glorious. And yet the, the new has surpassed the old. It has replaced it in a sense. And just like Moses had to cover his face due to the weakness of the people, so also many of the people, even to that day in Paul's day, uh, they were still weak and they were still covered with a veil themselves, spiritually speaking. So the message is, take off the veil and appreciate the glory of the new covenant. But I just mentioned this because Paul makes a big deal out of it. There's a whole chapter dedicated to it. And it all goes back to this passage that we've looked at tonight in Exodus chapter 34. So I know it's easy to kind of downplay the importance of the Old Covenant. You know, why aren't we studying some New Testament book? And we do go back and forth on a regular basis. And um, I, I think I could go to heaven if I've never really understood Exodus 34. But then again, I would not have the understanding of 2 Corinthians 3 that we have now. Uh, having studied, studied that original account back in Exodus. So I'm glad that we're studying this. Uh, this brings us to the end of Exodus 34. Thank you for joining us tonight. Again, if you have any questions or comments about the class tonight, if there's some way we can help, if there's something we can do to encourage you, if there's something we need to be praying about, get in touch, send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274, and we would love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's all go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, you truly are the God of glory a God of love and grace and a God of truth. And we're thankful tonight for your first law delivered through Moses, but we're especially thankful tonight for the new covenant delivered to us through your son, Jesus, who came to this earth to die and give himself up for us. Thank you, Father, for loving us, and thank you for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.